welcome to Season 10, Episode 13 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Tuesday the 13th of Theresa May, and we're going to discuss <laughs> what's been happening in the news and community. Uh, I'm Alan, joining me this week is Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello. How are you? Uh, yeah, not at all bad. Oh, sorry, the train going past there. Um, Nobody yes. noticed. Yes. I'm <laughs> Are you still continuing not to notice? This is good. This makes great radio. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. The weather is lovely, and I'm lovely. Super. <laughs> good to hear. Martin, are you equally lovely? Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually a bit sweaty, what with all this lovely weather, but yes, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Super good to hear it. So, um, we understand that you have been having some fun with new toys, and we want to hear all about it. Tell us, Martin, what have mm. you been playing with? Well, I've recently purchased a Razor Core, and inside the Razor Core, I have deposited a NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti graphics wait, card. Wait, 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 wait. What's a Razor Core, Martin? Uh-huh. Well, <clears throat> a Razor Core is an external enclosure which has a PCI Express slot in it that you can insert desktop grade graphics cards into. It's an um, external video card adapter yes, thing. Yes, I believe the kids call it a graphics amplifier. No way. I think that's the <laughs> You term. are kidding. Yeah. Oh, my God. Cool AF, I believe. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, so you plug, You're suddenly you plug... multiplying your cool now, Martin. <laughs> so you plug your laptop <laughs> into this. It's taken and then me. You, Sorry. You plug your laptop into this, then you add a graphics card, and then you plug your monitor into this as well. Yes, that's right. So you connect the Razor Core. So the Razor Core itself is actually really easy to insert the graphics card into. It's a toolless thing. So you you pull out the the rail and uh, you undo a thumb you know thumb screw, put the uh, card into the chassis, and then close it up again. And then you connect that to your laptop using a Thunderbolt three connector. So you have to have a fairly modern laptop to use this thing what is a thunderbolt 3 connector well it uses a usb-c connector so we're seeing lots of those on different devices now but the the key thing is is that one of the protocols that is supported here is thunderbolt 3 which is basically think of it as just a cable that connects to the pci bus on the computer itself but physically through a usb-c but physically through a usb-c cable yeah Okay, and, and uh, what, what were your? I, I mean, I imagine most people who are going to buy one of these are probably running Windows. And what on earth are you doing buying one? Well, I have heard that they work on Linux, and I wanted to find out one: do they work, and two: how well do they work? So uh, it was really an experiment, and uh, the experiment's gone quite well, actually. Uh, yeah, so it, it does work. <laughs> Albeit with a few caveats. So what did you do to to test it out? So I have several computers that have USB-C ports that support Thunderbolt 3. And by the powers of YouTube and the internet, I was informed that I happened to have at least three computers that were known to work with Linux. So uh, I have my Skull Canyon NUC, and I also have the Dell XPS 13 and the Dell XPS 15 uh, that have USB-C and Thunderbolt. So I thought I've got a, like a good chance of having at least one device that works here. Uh, because this Razer Core device is, you know, designed for the Razer line of laptops. So the Razer Blade Stealth and the Razer Blade Pro and all the rest right. of it. But it just so happens that there are some other laptops that happen to work as well. So that's why I got it. Uh, mostly out of curiosity, but also because racing games and and things, and I won't bore you with the details about you know vanishing points and all the rest of it, and why why that's important to me. So let me get this right: you would have a laptop on your desk, and you'd have this bulky black thing next to your laptop, and you plug a cable between the two, and then an external display plugged into one of the ports on the back of whatever video card you put into this black box, and on that external display you would have magical 3D pixels, and then on your laptop you'd have your keyboard and mouse where you're controlling the thing, and you're typing on your laptop and it's appearing on the external display through this black box, right? Yes and no. 
So you can do two things. You can display it on an external display. So I've been using an HDI monitor, but you can also reflect the image to the screen on the laptop as well. <laughs> Ooh, so it's, that's clever yeah yeah is that is this just a, a feature of thunderbolt which if you, if it supports the device at all it'll do or is there some extra gubbins which needs to be supported in your laptop so on linux it just does that and you actually have to go out of your way to tell it not to do that so on linux when you plug this thing in and then you switch the nvidia settings to say by the way, I'd like to use the NVIDIA drivers now, and you yeah. log out and log in. It's not all completely seamless yet. It probably could be, but I haven't gone that far with it. But once you've done that, it will actually display the output from the graph the external graphics card on the built-in display and the external monitor. But as I understand it, the performance is better when it's just going to the external monitor. So I've been turning off the internal monitor in order to do my bench testing. Right, and... Does it does it require that you have an external monitor, even if you just wanted to use it on the internal monitor? I haven't tested that specifically, but I think that you don't need an external monitor. Okay. The way that it's it works by default leads me to believe that you could use it just using the internal display and no external monitor at all. Right. And was I right in hearing you said it's got two slots? It has one PCI slot, but it's a double width slot. So it takes, you know, the big, uh, big beefy graphics, graphics controllers of today. Right. So it's basically got room for the big heat sink on the top. Uh, yes. Although you have to be careful. So I did get caught out by this. The first graphics card I got was a GTX 1080 Armor, which has got a sexy, you know, um, fan on it. And that was tall enough that it fitted in the enclosure. But when I connected the uh, power adapters, it made it just ever so too high that I couldn't slide it in. Oh. So I've actually read the specifications more carefully and done some sums. And I've now got a different graphics card that fits just fine. So you do, you do have to go into this knowing what the height limit of the cards plus yeah. the power connectors are. Is there like a lid on this thing or is it just like the bare card that you've put in the slot exposed to the world no it's a it's a confined box so it's a uh, aluminium alloy black box and the chassis has got a magnetic release so you pull a handle at the back and that releases the magnets and then you just slide the tray out you can then just plug the card in and then you just slide the tray back in again and that's it so it's changing a graphics card is like seconds it's really simple and so what kind of performance should you get out of this thing? Yeah, actually, It's all very good putting an external card in, but does it actually work at a comparative performance to you sticking it in a desktop PC? Yeah, so I did some, you know, reading and watching uh, prior to making this purchase, and people will give you a number somewhere between, if you had the same card and effectively the same laptop desktop setup. Some people have tested this in desktops that have USB-C Thunderbolt ports and tested the same card in the motherboard and on the Thunderbolt connector. And they'll claim somewhere between a 20 to 30% performance loss over what the card is capable of when it's on the bus directly. But that isn't the whole story because it really depends on the game itself and how CPU intensive it is. And also, interestingly, the higher the resolution that you drive your screen at. So if you've got a 4K screen, you'll actually find that differential comes down to about 5% performance difference between uh, on the card and on the bus. Because these GPU bound tasks, they can move that data across the bus just fine. And it's, it's all down to GPU compute at that point. Um, but to answer your question, does it make a difference? Yes, it makes a huge difference. Um, there'll be a graph in the show notes this week that show me testing this on a Skull Canyon Nuck, on a Tuxedo um, Infinity Book Pro, which we're going to review next week, and an XPS 15 and an XPS 13. And it compares the external GPU with the internal IGP or if it has some integrated NVIDIA also comparing with that. And to give you some idea of the differences, the, the Skull Canyon NUC is my beefiest of machines, albeit a little NUC. Um, the internal IGP can run the Unigen superposition 
benchmark at the medium 1080p settings, which are the default, at about 10 frames per second. Ouch. And when I plug this external box in, that goes up to about 107 frames per second. So Yowza. quite so a without, considerable improvement. Without wishing to read out a bunch of numbers on the graph, which people will see in the show notes. Basically, yep. it's like 10 times more better yes. than yes. the internal cards, which is well, like that's a massive jump. Yep. How much is it? How much? Um, the 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 Razer Core itself is four hundred and ninety nine pounds, and then whatever the cost of the GPU on top is. So for what I bought, which was a ten eighty Ti, uh, it was just over a thousand pounds or half a Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right. Wow. Um, but you know the reasons for me doing this were, were 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 experimentation, and also I knew I had a good chance of getting this to go. And most importantly, it's worked on all of the machines I've tried it in so far. Yeah. There's a couple of caveats for Linux, though. The first is that at the moment the Linux kernel doesn't support the authorization and security models of Thunderbolt three. So you have to have a device where you can turn off either enable legacy mode or disable security over Thunderport. Uh, Thunderbolt and um, I've been doing some research and apparently it looks like there's some fixes landing in the kernel hopefully for kernel 413 which will mean that on Linux we can make use of those um, authorization modes which you want because you're effectively it's an external device that you're plugging directly onto the bus of your computer so you really don't want it to be going around with you know yeah. all of that security disabled hmm. um, but once you've done that it works interesting um, yeah so um if any of our listeners have one of these devices or half a bitcoin to spare we'd be interested to know your experience yeah. but also if you have a laptop or desktop that you can plug this thing it's quite a set of things you need in order for this to happen yeah. right today but to give you sort of relative performance there's a there's a forum post on the gaming for linux forum which is called the superposition benchmark and my system is currently the number two system on that benchmark at the moment, which is directly behind the only other person with a um, NVIDIA 1080 Ti with a current generation Ryzen processor. <laughs> so you can get, you know, and it's comfortably close as well. It's, it's comfortably in second position. So you can get very, very close to sort of um, real in the box performance with this setup i'm very impressed and i've now okay. got four computers that can use it so super a worthwhile investment enough of that nonsense let's get on with it and now it's time for some news First in the news this week we have an erratum about something we spoke about previously uh, now, since recording episodes 9, 10, and 12, <laughs> and probably 11, I'd imagine, it's been confirmed by Microsoft that it will not be possible to install terminal applications on Windows 10 S. And that means, unfortunately, that you won't be able to install Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, or Fedora uh, from the Ooh. Windows Store on Windows 10 S. So it yeah. did seem to be that it was sort of implied when we uh, when it was announced that there would be um, these uh, well that the Windows 10s would run whatever is in the Windows Store, uh, and it was separately announced that um, these various Windows subsystem for Linux systems would be in the Windows Store. But unfortunately, the uh, this has since been clarified. It hasn't been changed. It's been clarified. Right. Um, a Theresa and, May style clarification. Yeah, pro probably because, you know, we made a big song and dance about what a great thing this was going to be. And Microsoft obviously heard us, you know, lauding the benefits of having WSL on Windows 10S and they felt they needed to, you know, set the record straight. Absolutely. I'm sure that's yeah. exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. I'm, I'm sure of it. Meanwhile, in non-Microsoft news, uh, the father of Android has launched an essential phone. This comes from Andy Rubin, who... Uh, used to work for Google uh, via acquisition of his company, which originally back in the day created Android. Uh, he's also created other devices before he created Android. And since leaving Google, he's become an investor. And one of the things he's investing in is this essential phone, which got announced today as we're recording this. 
and it looks very much like many phones in that it's a rectangular slab of glass. <laughs> um, but there are a few things that differentiate it from some of the other phones on the market, uh, as you have to differentiate yourself from everything else in order to get a sale. One of the things is the front-facing camera is kind of in a cutout of the display, and that's because the display reaches to most of the edge of the front of the thing. So right up to the top and most of the way to the left and right and most of the way down to the bottom of the phone. So it's quite weird how you see this like little cutout where the camera is, but it's a bit um, tricky for them to put it anywhere else. I guess they could put it in the chin of the phone and then it would be like the Dell XPS with it looking up your nose <laughs> while, you're, while you're on a, you know, a Skype call on your phone or whatever. Um, one of the other interesting things is they've debranded it, so there's no yeah. company logos on the back. Um, and I, I find like this, that. yeah, that's quite interesting. And it, one thing that interests me is a, a comment that someone said to me many years ago was, or a, a post I saw online, which was one of the first things children see now is the logo of the phone that their parents have when they're mm. taking photos. Mm. So children see Apple logos and Samsung mm -hmm. logos and things on their mm. phone, and this thing doesn't have those, which I thought was interesting. So you've described some of the characteristics of this phone there, but how is this an essential phone as to just another Android phone? Well, there's a couple of other interesting parts. One, they, they're talking about it being upgradable with components that can be added on. So rather than just being a phone that you buy and then get rid of, there can be additional things that will keep you in the ecosystem ongoing. Uh, so, for example, the uh, there's a 360-degree camera which can clip on, and there's a couple of points where it attaches, pins on the back, uh, where it attaches to the top of the phone and can talk wirelessly to the phone. Now, I'm not completely convinced by this because we've seen... Many, many times over the years, hardware vendors create a thing, whatever that is, and then offer future updates via some kind of attached, you know, device. And this, this happens both in computing and gaming and consoles and all kinds of areas. People create things that have attachments. So I'm not entirely convinced by that. We will see. Yes, um, I mean, my thought when I saw this is they refer to it as uh, as a future-proof upgradable connector, but it's only future-proof if your next phone is one of these phones. It's not like it's an open standard they're adopting. It's well, also, something which you're you're hoping that they don't go bust and that's the only one of these things they ever make. And also, the reason why you upgrade your phone isn't always um, because there's some external thing you want to have on it. It's... Like, for me, the reason why I upgraded my phone was basically RAM. And yeah. I doubt you're going to find, like, a RAM thing that hangs off of these two pogo pins <laughs> on the back of the phone. Yeah. Unless the whole board, you know, RAM and CPU are a thing. Not going to happen, is it? Perhaps. I mean, this was tried with the uh, Sailfish phone. They had a thing called The Other Half. There was a connector on the back of the phone, and you could buy a keyboard which attached to the back of the phone so you can have a physical hardware keyboard but i don't know of many other devices or many other uh, components that were added to the selfish ecosystem i may be wrong let me know if you have a bunch of hardware that no, goes with your i couldn't selfish get hold phone. i couldn't get hold of the other half at all i've got two mm. selfish phones now and no accessories ah so so we'll keep an eye on that and see how that moves on well here it is folks Chrome has won. Andreas Gall, the former Mozilla CTO and head of Firefox OS, has uh, essentially said that the uh, the Mozilla fight is in vain, and uh, that mobile is a distraction was a distraction from mobile's goal of an open web, and that they're losing market share hand over fist. So, um, what are we going to do about that then? <laughs> hmm. Well, the the thing is that this this came as a bit of a reply to a post by uh, Eric Pettit, who uh, also works at Mozilla. Currently works at Mozilla. Can I just ask uh, what browser he's using? Well, it's interesting you should say that. Uh, <laughs> the first the first paragraph made me smile in his in Eric's post where he talks about uh, Firefox 
having a bit of a marketing push, which they're calling Browse Against the Machine. It's a pushback against Chrome, mostly. Um, but the, the interesting part of that first paragraph was he has two browsers open, Firefox for work and Chrome for play, customized settings for each. And that just rang an alarm bell straight away. Mm. That A, why doesn't he have two profiles in Firefox, for mm-hmm. one? I mean... Or what is it that he can't do in Firefox that he uses Chrome for? Yeah, um, that's like one of you two saying, oh, I use Ubuntu for work, but Windows for play. <laughs> imagine what? imagine that. Imagine having a <laughs> Windows machine that you keep around just for entertainment I'm, purposes. I'm feeling really confident with the way this discussion's going, Popey. How about you? Oh, crud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> mm. It's um, not like I work for Ubuntu or anything. <laughs> Yeah. I, uh, but anyway, the, the article <clears throat> the article that we linked to is uh, a response to that post, which is from uh, Andreas Gal, who used to work at Mozilla, is talking about how Chrome has won and shows some stats to back this up, and that it's kind of a bit futile, really. So but yeah, it's so, an interesting story. So here's a question, Mark Allen: What browsers are you using generally? Not necessarily now, but what do you tend to use? Chrome. I use Firefox. Um, it, well, I mean, I'm a web developer, so I use all of them for testing at work. But um, my general use browser is Firefox. Okay. My, and can I just ask, Alan, why do you choose to use Chrome? I chose to use Chrome. My initial reason, I, I used to switch between one browser and another. I used to flip-flop between Firefox, Chromium, and Chrome until I got annoyed enough by the browser's whatever whatever it was that would annoy me and i'd switch and in the past i've been annoyed by performance data loss um and crashes Mm -hmm. and in i'm not specifying which browser it was but i've had that in various browsers at various times and so i've ended up on chrome because it is the least worst performance i've not had data loss and it doesn't crash so yeah that that's that's why because i want something that works um mark can I ask why you're satisfied with Firefox? Uh, basically, uh, I mean, part of it is um, the extensions. So I have the ex- all the extensions that I that I use set up just right. And if I try and switch to something else, I probably won't have all of them um, that I that I want. Um, and the other thing is, there's I I mean, I've I've had conversations with Alan over the years several times where he's been like having these horrific problems with firefox which i've never had so mm. you know it's never been a problem for me to I, I since i, I since just I, use it differently you know I, I don't know whether it's because i have a thousand tabs open or oh, there is that yeah i you i i browse the web very differently to how alan browses the web yeah and ju- just just for completeness i actually have two chrome sessions open i have one with my home profile running and one with a work profile running and the reason that i do that is because in my experience multiple profiles work better under chrome than they do in firefox and it was that multi profile support that was really key to me moving over to chrome hmm. yeah i that was another reason why and i have I have a similar thing for you. I have a home profile and a work profile, and actually I have 20 profiles in total in Chrome. So I have those two main ones, and I have a whole bunch of others for all kinds of different personalities. Yeah, as, as do I. I have more than those two, but those are the two that I always have open. Mm. Yeah, when I said I browse the web differently, that's exactly the kind of weird stuff I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, no, no, yeah, okay. I'll let you have that. Uh, moving on uh, finally in the news there's some worrying security and privacy news that is a bug in sudo which can allow a sudoer to gain full root privileges Uh, the bug hinges on a function that reads in space delimited data uh, including a column that can have a value containing spaces injected by a malicious user whatever that means it sounds fairly simple actually yeah it 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 reads it get, gets the output of a process and reads some data, but you can sort of poke in a, a value where it reads the value you put in instead of the value it was looking for. And then you can basically spoof things and rewrite things and elevate your privileges. Interesting. But yeah. there are updates out there. So happy days, everyone update your systems, I presume. 
no logo yet for this. <laughs> oh, oh well. So this yeah, won't feature on. Yeah, this won't feature on popular <laughs> news sites because it doesn't have a nice brand and a domain registered. Oh well. Should we move on? Yeah. Let's. And now it's time for a roundup of the community news and events. And our first item from the community this week is that build.snapcraft.io has been launched as a beta service. And this is a website that will enable you to hook up your GitHub repository with your snapcraft.yaml sat inside it, connect it to the Ubuntu build farm and the snap store so you can commit code and automatically land your snaps in the snap store in so, seconds so up until now you could do this already but you had to be in launchpad is that correct yes so previously you had to manually set up git mirroring in launchpad and then create a snap recipe in launchpad based on that git mirror that you'd created and it all worked but there was lots of steps that you had to jump through but now you go to build.snapcraft.io you click the sign in with github button it connects your github repositories you pick the ones or the one you're interested in and it automatically hooks the whole thing together and most importantly this is every commit a build happens cool yes uh also in other community news uh richard hughes who is a prominent developer on the GNOME platform, uh, works for Red Hat, and works also on uh, GNOME software, has written a blog post about updating Logitech hardware on Linux. And I found this interesting because I recently used some software that Richard had developed, the firmware update utility on the Dell XPS 13 that we were sent uh, by Dell. Uh, And I thought this was interesting because... Now the the firmware update utility is is growing the ability to update the firmware in devices other than just your laptop. And so uh, Richard's uh, blog post talks about a vulnerability or a, a problem in an external device, a Logitech device, um, and how he's made some changes to uh, the firmware update utility and calls for help to get people to um, help test this um, driver uh, update or firmware update tool. Yeah, I think this firmware update utility is really great. And also, when I was talking earlier about the Razor Core, that itself has firmware updates for the Thunderbolt protocol. Mm. And I've read with interest that it will soon be possible to update the Thunderbolt firmware firmware using the same utility. That's really cool. It's great to be able to... I mean, I remember having a laptop that had um, a firmware update that was required and I had to go through all kinds of hoops to get it unpacked and use all kinds of Windows utilities and, and things to get it decompressed and onto an image that I could actually install on this, this HP laptop. Uh, things have got better now. You know, you could, you could get a, a DOS boot disk for many machines or they can flash the firmware directly from the BIOS and things like that. But, um, this is great for those people who don't run Windows and want yeah. to update the firmware. And I know you lovingly refer to Windows as Game OS. <laughs> and, I, and I refer to it as Firmware OS because the only purpose <laughs> I have for Windows from time to time is to just update BIOS and firmware images on machines. Awesome. And uh, finally, in the community news this week, um, Trevino has written a blog post about uh, Ubuntu GNOME theming and encouraging people to get involved with uh, the theme stuff that's coming out for GNOME 3 that looks like uh, we're used to seeing Ubuntu on Unity and encouraging people to get involved and make it awesome. Yep, I recommend you do that thing. Marco is um, a very talented Ubuntu developer and is doing lots of work to add some shine and polish to what will be Ubuntu 17.10 and everyone likes trying out new themes, right? Mm, absolutely great stuff 
And lastly, we've got one event this week. Uh, we have the 15th Egham Raspberry Jam, which is taking place on Sunday, the 23rd of July at, in Staines upon Thames at the Gartner offices. Uh, each week, uh, each week, each time they run these events, they have a, a theme of sorts. And this time they're going to be running a number of workshops, including graphics and physical computing using Scratch. So if you've ever wanted to get your hands dirty with some physical computing, you know, make any LEDs light up and dim and buzzers go buzz and all the rest of it then this is probably a good one this is a an event for the whole family so uh, if you're looking to get into the raspberry pi then head over to the 15th eggham raspberry jam excellent we know you must be using the brilliant pocket cast because it's well brilliant you can be brilliant too by giving each Ubuntu podcast episode a star in the Pocket Cast show notes to help more brilliant people find our brilliant show. Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant! It's, it's great. It? <laughs> Always reminds me of the Fast Show whenever I hear that. <laughs> it really does. Uh, that's all for episode 13. Uh, we'll be back next week when we'll be reviewing the Tuxedo Infinity Book Pro 13 laptop and going over your feedback. Woohoo! Excellent. Yeah. That's another piece of hardware to look at. Yes. We, we're doing well on the laptop reviews. <laughs> we year. are, yes. Let us know if there's anything else you want us to review or anything. Especially if you want to send it to us. Yes, or anything else you want us to cover. You know where to send the feedback. Share with the Bintu Podcast. Bye bye. Bye. Can I eat my moussaka now?